Hi, I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. Every episode, we explore death, dying, and grief through stories by authors familiar with the topic. Writers are our translators. They take what is inexpressible, impossible to explain, and they translate it into words on a page. Today's guest is Lucinda Herring. Her book is Reimagining Death, Stories and Practical Wisdom for Home Funerals and Green Burials. Lucinda has been a home funeral advocate for more than 20 years. Families call her when they are curious or interested in a home funeral or burial experience that's outside the mainstream. After my conversation with Barbara Asher, I was so struck by the sweet human gestures she did to take care of her husband after he died. If you remember, Barbara told us how she intuitively kept Bob's body at home for a few days. She played his favorite music, insisted that his body wasn't put in a bag. Instead, she draped him with a cozy blanket, put his favorite hat on his head. Those thoughtful gestures really stuck with me. I wanted to know more. What else was possible? What else could we do differently? Are we missing out on opportunities to better take care of our loved ones? So naturally, I called Lucinda. She has a wealth of information and resources, and I can't wait to talk with her. Hi, Lucinda. It's great to meet you. You too, Sarah. I've heard a lot about you. How did you get into this work? I got into the work when a dear friend on Whidbey was dying of breast cancer in 1997. And she looked at us and said, I just don't want to go to a funeral home. Can you please care for me yourselves? And we didn't have any idea that we could do that. But we began researching uh, what was possible. We discovered that families can indeed care for their own dead. And then we figured out we could do it legally. And then we actually didn't even need the funeral home. And so we taught ourselves how to do it. And then we had this remarkable experience with Judy. Mm-hmm. and. We were so transformed by the experience that we decided most of us wanted that kind of care rather than a funeral home. And so we just made vows to each other that we would do that if at all possible. And then we realized, I particularly realized that we needed to interface with the funeral industry and not just be doing this home care in the woods on Whitby kind of fringe movement. And so I did a lot of home funeral training to know how to do everything, particularly the paperwork and the actual care of the body. And then I was lucky to um, know a woman, Shar Barrett, who was starting uh, a green funeral home in Everett, Washington. And that was in 2010. So that was quite a number of years later. But Mm -hmm. she invited me to come and get my funeral director's license. So I was very blessed to be able to do that because I was able to, you know, get my license in an alternative green funeral home from the beginning. And we were one of the first funeral homes in the country to empower families to be more engaged and work more creatively with after death care. And what's the name of the green funeral home? It's called a sacred moment. Still there. Mm -hmm. Char's the director of that. You mentioned not being a fringe, sort of on Winby Island. When did you learn that this care for the body is not a fringe thing? It actually is what used to happen years and years ago prior to the funeral industry being formed, that women would come and take care of their dead. Oh, well, we knew that from the beginning. (laughs) I had studied death and dying for a long time as a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner, but also as a Waldorf-trained teacher which I did in an earlier life. And the anthroposophical community always has these three-day vigils. And then, you know, just to know that we were reclaiming this sacred task of caring for our loved ones, instead of giving that task away to strangers, it was just deeply affirming of, you know, what we were choosing. And interestingly, looking back, so this was 1997, It was just beginning, mostly, interestingly, amongst women Mm. in many different places all around the country. 
at the same time. And I've always loved knowing that we were just in our little way part of this larger emergence. I love so many stories in your book. The the woman who told the story about her husband's three days at home and the first day she was emotional, the second day she started to accept it, and by the third day she was ready to let it go. And that sort of ability to take the time, where it's yes. so rare to take the time to grieve. That was Lori Reapy. She and her husband, Julian, they were my dear friends from long ago, and I had lost touch with them. And when Julian knew he was dying eventually of cancer, he wanted to do death with dignity. And he was a vital, you know, very alive man. And it was shocking to a lot of us just to get behind his choice. Not, I mean, not for me, because I was working in the funeral home and I was really grateful that I could be of help. But I did go to their house and work with a large group of friends, you know, to come to an acceptance of his choice. And he was the leader in that. It was an incredible experience. Um, he was extraordinary in saying, this is what I'm going to do. And I've chosen it. And Lori and I are together in it. And my children are together with me. And at every, we were all meeting you know, in this living room. And it was such a powerful experience to see a human being embrace his own death so consciously and so beautifully. But it, it was hard. It was very hard. And so Laurie and, and Julian and I knew that they, we were going to need at least three days mm. to come to terms with this decision of his and, you know, have enough time, again, to just be to be with the process and to be with the process in a safe place, their home, in a place where um, Lori and the children and, and all the friends could grieve openly and whenever they needed, you know, with times to laugh, times to tell stories, times to sing. And Julian really held court in a way. I mean, he had died, but his spirit was so present and it was the very thing that everyone needed was that extra time. And that was particularly true because of death with dignity choice, but it's been true in so many other situations. I had a friend who died suddenly of a tragic accident last April on Whidbey. And that was a much more difficult endeavor to bring her home to her farm on Whidbey. But I managed to do it with Char's help from a sacred moment. And again, because it was such a sudden and shocking death, everyone needed a lot of time, especially her children and grandchildren, to come to terms with the fact that this had happened. And that was another example for me of how helpful and healing it can be to give ourselves that extra time if we can. Yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit about how art and poetry play into the death experience, because I will say I've been through sort of traditional, you know, the funeral home comes, takes the body, you might view the body, you might have a funeral. But what really intrigues me is the idea of this either pine box or cardboard box that you can decorate and involve the children with art and poetry. And your book has poetry in it. And well, I'm, I'm thinking again of Julian because he was a, a, a wonderful poet and he had a little class in his neighborhood with children and he helped them write poetry. They wrote poetry together. So when he died and we had this vigil, one, we invited all the children to come and do art on his cardboard casket. He was cremated. So we had a cardboard container for him. And which is a good thing because you can do wonderful art on that. You can also do art on a pine coffin as well. We've done that before. This was a cardboard one and we set it up in the hallway outside where he was lying in state and the children and all the parents as well could come and make his little boat, we called it. So was he in the cardboard box? 
He was not in it at the time. No, it was just there with art supplies and, you know, room for people to get around it. But the most beautiful thing was that the children who had worked with him in his poetry class all wrote poems for him. And they put those poems in the container to go with him, to accompany him to the crematorium. And then when we were bringing him out, before we brought him out, several of the children stood and recited their poetry, which was just so beautiful and meaningful. And again, you know, there they were being present with Julian, who was not alive and now dead, but they were still in the field of his holding of them, right, as budding poets. So that was a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. One of the things we talk about in Peaceful Exit is creating your own circle around this subject matter. And and as you said, people need to be willing. And so being very gracious and asking, you know, if you are willing to take on a certain job at the end of my life. In fact, we had our annual meeting with a dear friend of mine and who's in her late 70s and has created this pod around her um, and because of my cold, I was actually on a speakerphone versus in the room, and everyone else was in the room. And I said, so have you all considered keeping Anne's body at home for us to have a vigil? Um, there was kind of a pause. And of course, I can't <laughs> see the people, so I'm like, I wonder what they're, you know. And yeah. are we comfortable with that? Because these are not blood relatives, they're friends of hers. Right. It, it was really an interesting moment. A telling moment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's it strikes me the pause of the silence is is appropriate. Yes. Right? Because they have not had that experience. So ha- they can't even say if they're willing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, I've met with families where the person who's dying wants this and the family doesn't really <laughs> know if they want it. And so it's really important to, you know, meet beforehand and have such a a gathering with questions like you were asking. Mm. One thing I always stress, or I ask deeply, right, of each person there who might be being asked to be the team to take care of someone who's died. First, I ask them, how does this sit with you in your body? How do you feel? So I help people imagine it. So I would tell a story about another home vigil experience that I've had so that they can begin to imagine it and to experience in their bodies, whether they feel resistance, whether they feel, oh my goodness, I'd love to do that. I mean, in my own family, there was such a difference in my sisters and brother and my father when my mother was dying about did they want to do that or not. And what we'll always find in a group of people is that some really will not want to and others will be drawn to it and they'll know that they want to, you know. So finding that out beforehand is extremely helpful because often in the face of death, the experience we have is feeling helpless mm-hmm. and powerless and we don't know what to do. and We don't know what to say. And we, it just, you know, is awkward rather than supportive and opening. So in that gathering, you know, we would help like who would like to drive like if we can if we can get a permit to bring the body ourselves to the cemetery who would like to be that person who drives who Mm -hmm. would like to be the one to carry the body you know who would like to be the ones who sacredly wash the body and prepare it it's wonderful to see people know in a way right and 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 in some ways, you don't know because you've never experienced it. I mean, what is true for all of us is this is a threshold of experience that we do not have in our lives and bodies. And you have to go through that threshold. And once you've gone through it, you're really a different person in relationship to death. It's um, that's definitely been my experience. So what kinds of questions do people ask you when they're considering a family-directed funeral for the first time? So one of the ones that always comes up is, how do we care for somebody who's died? And um, will they smell? That's the one that always comes up. (laughs) I'm sure. And will it be messy? Will it be dangerous? 
you know, or a health hazard, which is absolutely not true at all. I, I know there's several stories in your books about transporting bodies um, and that it's legal for you to do so, but you need a special permit. Are there any other pieces of practical wisdom you'd like to share about family-directed funerals? Yes, the practical wisdom that is essential is that um, families and communities need to do these kind of things within the law. Because if we start doing them and don't do it within the law, then the opportunity is going to be taken away from us. So it's very important to particularly know how to do the paperwork. Another challenge is that each state is different. There's an organization that we helped form the women in this movement early on called the National Home Funeral Alliance, NHFA, and it has enormous resources for you know, helping families navigate these paperwork challenges. You mentioned a advanced after-death care directive. That's not something we often hear about. It's not a legal document. You say it's an ethical document. Right. Could you define that and why is that important for us to each have? Basically, we, we made this up. Women in the movement, we knew that there's really three parts of the threshold of death. There's the dying, there's the moment of death, and then there's the after death care. And we do these advanced health care directives, right, and living wills and get our power of attorney in place and all that. But then there's a whole other need, which is the after death directive. And so many of us don't do that. So when we began doing this kind of work and this movement emerged, a lot of us realized that there needed to be the third completion of paperwork. Um, I mean, different people call it different things. I called it advanced after death care directive because I wanted it to be linked with advanced health care directive, right? Particularly if, if one is wanting these more alternative choices like family directed funerals, doing one's own paperwork, having the vigil, finding your team, choosing a green burial, which, you know, is becoming more and more accepted, but still is in many ways a minority choice. Um, it's really important to have something like the Advanced After Death Care Directive because it basically faces directly <laughs> the fact that you're making these alternative choices. And in order to make them, you're trying the best you can to support those left behind to fulfill those wishes for you. Mm -hmm you're more likely to have those wishes fulfilled if you've created such a directive. And if people who are going to be around you when you die know your wishes and have, like we talked about earlier, signed on to be a team, if at all possible, you're less likely to have it happen if there's no paperwork in place and no directive that tells others, particularly your children, your adult children, and close relatives, you know, who again may may not have ever heard of what you're wanting, to have them read your directive before you die and have discussions about it and really feel from the person dying how much they want it, right? Because I, if I, I've experienced that in family groups where the person dying says, this is what I really want. Are you, you know, willing to help me? And some of the willingness comes from the fact that you love that person and you want them to have what they wish for. And then for someone who helps facilitate this kind of care, it is so helpful. It's so helpful. It's so helpful to me, Yes. you know, to, to have that directive in place and to be able to go back to that directive and say to the family, well, this is what this person really wanted. Yeah. How can we try to make this happen? Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, that's fantastic. So I'd love to read this paragraph from your book um, and just see what comes up for you. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We have seen how crafting a home funeral vigil together for someone or sharing the job of filling in a grave can forge lasting bonds of connection and intimacy among people. Shared artistic and living responses at the time of death, casket building, rituals, prayers, poetry, singing or whatever feels right to those gathered, can be the very means by which we are able to handle or bear what is happening to us. It is this sense of community where we are not alone, but are being carried by the love and support of others that can make all the difference in our journey of loss and mourning. 
Yeah, well, interestingly, what it brings up are these um, different stories and experiences where I've been there in the room and watched what could have been a, just a terrible experience be held in this field of blessing you know, and, and love. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of my friend who died in the tragic death last April on Whidbey and just the extraordinary um, response from our community. And I, I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it, taken care of her without the community behind me, right? And the team of women who came and washed our friend Josette's body after she had been brought home from the medical examiner and she was deeply harmed. You know, it was, it was not an easy task. And, but we did it together. We bore it together. Elders of our community held her children, her three adult children and her five grandchildren. And we were able to create a vigil where they were completely part of knowing that their grandmother had died, being with her, um, bringing compost and flowers from her farm and decorating the shroud and then carrying her to the car. And the children were completely involved. And I watched as the shock in the family was softened and eased. The community was holding each other. And in holding each other, we were holding them particularly. I mean, the shock was still there. The The grief and the rawness of it was still there. It didn't make it go away. It just eased it and made it bearable. I've spoken to a few authors about the importance of grieving in community. How can we learn to grieve in community the way you're describing? I think we do at one death at a time. Um, You know, I mean, starting with Judy in 1997, that was the first, right? That we we learned that we could do this together and that it helped so much. And then that was so transformative that then the next time someone died, um, you know, we, we did it again. And the common denominator in that was there was a group of us, right, who yes. were who were saying, we will help. And I was one who was saying, not only will I help, but I'll go and get licensing and I'll get credentials to um, be able to make this possible. So there is legwork to be done and, you know, study and a learning curve to know how to do this. And it, it's, it is clear that People need to say, I, I want to do this, right? Yeah. I, I don't want to just call the funeral home. I, I do want to be involved in helping make this happen where I live. So there's a process that needs to be put in place. But the more we do it, the more we can do it and the easier it gets. So I think it's something that, that happened like it did with Josette when it was such a tragic death. We had been preparing for years to to do that, right? And of course, we're an island, and it's easier. It's easier on an island, you know. And, but these kind of communities can be formed anywhere in the cities. I, I I know of these these kind of communities forming. And the more it's done, the more you you feel a part of the community, and you feel able to do it. So you've talked about your friend Josette dying unexpectedly on Whitby Island, but what if someone dies in a hospital and how can you still have the vigil or the after death care? It's, it's more difficult to have a vigil just because you're interfacing with an institution, Mm -hmm. right? With a hospital and they're not laws, but policies. Of course they do. They have to have policies about how they run the hospital. So, it depends on the type of death. I mean, when Josette died, she was in ICU and we had to take her off life support. Uh, it, it really, it was my presence that uh, allowed that whole effort to bring her home happen. Mine and working with Shar uh, at a sacred moment. Shar did the paperwork for us because it's much more complicated if the medical examiner is involved mm. with an accident. 
But if someone were dying in the hospital of, say, cancer, and, you know, so many people do die in the hospital, so it's very important, this, this question. There can be a lot of preparation and proactive questioning and working with hospital staff before that person dies, if there's time, um, for the family to let the staff know. Sometimes it's a social worker. Sometimes it can be someone who's in charge of taking bodies away from the hospital once they die. So the family can interface with that staff and say what their wishes are, that they would actually like to have their loved one leave the hospital and come back to the home. And different hospitals will have different policies, different staff members are open to this or not, right? There's often in our experience a level of absolutely not, that is not done, you know, but it, ha it has a level of fear around it, really fear that they don't actually know whether it can yeah, be done or yeah. not, right? right? Because nobody's ever asked. So I always encourage families to, to be as proactive as possible. And sometimes I've, I've acted as an interface, you know, and saying that I'm a licensed funeral director and that immediately calms staff people down. Sure. <laughs> because that's who they normally release a body to, is a licensed funeral director, not the family. But then there's an education piece needed where, you know, the, either the family or someone like me can educate the staff that it indeed is legal for a family if they have the burial transit permit to actually have the body released to them. It's a challenge. And sometimes families just do not have the wherewithal or the energy or the perseverance to keep going. So often I will recommend in that case that they work with a funeral director who is open to bringing a loved one home instead of a morgue at a funeral home. Shar and I did this a lot at a sacred moment. We would interface with the hospital and help bring that person home. So I'd love to say one more thing about hospital deaths because I've had wonderful experiences of families letting go of the need to bring someone who's died home asking the nurses and the staff if there's a room where that person can be taken for a few hours. So they're not just rushed to the morgue, which is the normal procedure, but that there's a room set aside where the person can lie in, in vigil state for a few hours, right? And then the family can gather, the friends can gather. They can do a mini version of a vigil in the hospital room. And there's been some beautiful experiences just supporting families to do that. I've been in, the, in a room where everyone was singing and children running in and out. And it was sort of a, you know, a hospital version of the home vigil, but it was just as sacred, just as incredible. In fact, in some ways more so, because it was that kind of richness of soul and sacred care was just filling the hospital room with, you know, which is often we feel as sterile and harsh. The softening that happened from that families doing that was incredibly moving to me. What does a peaceful exit mean to you? Mm. A peaceful exit would be where I could be in relationship to nature, where I could feel supported by the natural world to help me um, leave my human body in a way that is as relaxed and as without stress and tension as possible. Mm. I think I would want silence um, because I'm a meditator. And the depths of silence for me are a world to explore. And I'm exploring that in life. And it just gets more and more spacious. And so I would want that kind of depth and spaciousness of silence to be around me as I died. Um, maybe with a bird song within it. <laughs> maybe open the window. <laughs> yeah, open the window, have the natural world be present. 
not maybe, I would love that. That would be part of the silence, the field of silence. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I would want, and of course, this is hard to ask of others, but I would want there to be those present who are accepting that this is happening and can hold that space for me, you know, because I I think I'd be okay to die alone uh, because I lived alone for so long and it's just, you know, I'm good at it. (laughs) But I don't necessarily want to die alone. I would just want the people who were there to understand my wishes and to hold sacred space for that to happen if at all possible. I mean, in the Tibetan tradition, you know, the teachings say that if someone's there who is wailing and crying and not wanting you to leave, it makes it much more difficult for a a consciousness to leave. Mm. And I I think that's probably true because you're being distracted back into this world when really all of one's focus and intention can help I think you leave the body in a, in a more peaceful way. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was really interesting, and I'm, I've learned a great deal reading the book. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity to share, you know, a great passion of mine. Yes, really. absolutely. Yeah. I could talk all day. I love that. 